thanks everyone for joining today's presentation. Just talking about institutional integrity, democracy, human rights, and I link to social media as um, reflected by the social governance outreach cluster. This is part of the one of the newer investigations we are looking at. So just to look at a current pressing issue within social governance. So within social media in recent years, there have been notable examples of political polarisation and cultural wars, particularly within social media, but also within the mainstream media. Uh, there are quite a few academic studies looking at this, the ways in which misinformation can be, can be used, uh, identitarian politics, and it can have an undermining impact on democratic integrity, lawmaking and policy, policy considerations and uh, in institutional integrity broadly. While certainly many people are not part of this or you know, are above this, there are nonetheless groups on the left and right, so it's not one group or the other, but politically in general, who are nonetheless able to wield enough traction and influence uh, things to alter laws, which can in many ways contravene normal standard democratic processes. Um, there are many preconditions and lack of uh, government accountability have existed within uh, governments within the West that have led to some of these radical responses, so which have enabled these things to, to transpire, which in some cases then therefore lead to further eroding of human rights and democracy. So there have been examples of democratically elected governments that have not shown enough accountability, transparency, and then the outcome is seeing people being pushed to sort of radical fringes and sort of exerting far less than positive uh, influences on society and, and on institutions. So perhaps the most concerning aspect of culture wars is where activist groups, um, or say activist groups, usually it's seen in the positive, but it's, it's pressure groups, whatever it might be, seek to influence in ways that breach human rights and democracy. So uh, lobbyists have in the past called for increased sentences for crimes. So this is there's been infiltration into through social media and different media campaigns for sentencing for crimes, which can be often sensationalist. So so the notorious crimes can be lobbied for for, for legislation which in some ways undermine uh, democratic accountability, uh, democratic processes within judicial institutions, and um, kind of infringe upon that democratic process. There's also been plenty of examples where judicial process has been impacted on, from juries to, to judges, magistrates being influenced by social media. There have been articles by Thrive on this, and there's plenty of different academic studies looking into, into this issue. Uh, the, this has been since the digital age has, has been existent, essentially, and particularly since social media has been a prominent, prominent force. So again, right and left wing discourse from different groups can navigate between what is acceptable and marginalised groups that can be gotten away with marginalising. So in many cases, there are no go zones, but some groups will be nonetheless marginalised where it is seen as permissible to do so. It's used effective fear mongering and incitement through, through social media. Again, there are things like we have hate speech laws and incitement to violence, which are illegal, but there are certain loopholes to that which still allow people to get away with certain things and deliberately utilising things like fear mongering and incitement where they can legally. So just to give an example, in the United Kingdom, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission has been investigated to be downgraded by the United Nations due to suggestions of not being politically impartial on human rights issues. So independent bodies such as this are supposed to be independent, but concern exists naturally where the highest standards of civil liberties are replaced with political interests, echoing pressure from social media or expansion from social media. So if you've got uh, social media groups or um, echo chambers either infiltrating into these institutions or capitulating to pressure in, in certain ways or using those, those uh, existent uh, echo chambers as an excuse not to act in those higher regards, acting as though they are coerced when they obviously aren't because they are independent to this. So following that, if we, if we look at, say, in the United States, they're beginning uh, more than 10 years ago, there have been uh, focuses on looking at police brutality. There have been uh, different campaigns looking at marginalised groups, uh, ethnic groups who particularly face consequence uh, police brutality in countries like the United States, for example. So ethnic minorities, but also people with mental illness, etc., homeless people. Um, most victimised by police brutality in the, in the United States. But since this has been promoted, there's been things like Black Lives Matter and so forth. There hasn't really been any change. This has largely increased. So 2023 saw a record number of killings by police in the United States with percentages of ethnic groups largely unchanged. So basically very little has changed. It's just increased. 
despite the campaigns, the very reasonable campaigns, discussing the fact that there is police brutality, there are things like excessive sentences for people, particularly from uh, vulnerable groups. These things have been put forward as, as part of amendments to laws to say these things need to change. Nonetheless, we see reactivity to that, and, it's, and part of that reactivity could also be linked to some of the more radical uh, identitarian notions of that which can co-opt those very legitimate calls for action and co-opt it into an identitarian or seemingly radical approach within echo chambers, which can therefore be more easily dismissed and allow police brutality to then continue. And another example of corruption, just in a completely different context, looking at things like fast fashion. Um, there have been uh, different fast fashion brands which have dramatically increased their supply in recent years um, linked to China and some of the a couple of these li very large fast uh, fashion brands have been basically using Yuga and other minorities as slave labour, so literally as slaves to uh, produce the cheap fashion. This has taken off in recent years, but in the United States, the European Union has called for bans on imports or higher, higher taxing of these imports. Of course, most people aren't aware of this, but policymakers should be. Um, and Australia has been largely behind on this issue, but has been called on by international bodies to place, you know, put in place this. So just the fact that policymakers are aware of this issue, um, they should be acting on it, um, as a, in contrast to the general public, who, who generally, for the most part, aren't. Yes, yeah, so many governments across the West have allowed for many of the social issues to exist as a consequence of economic interests of corporations. So there have been many different approaches that have, that have taken shape. So part of these preconditions have been notably, and these have entered into a lot of the populist reactive discourse uh, within social media and the media broadly. So there's been things like mixed migration. Some of this has been linked, as discussed in the previous presentation, to the impact of some of the neo-colonial and imperialist invasion of countries recently. There's been, we saw in the Arab Spring in you know, 2011, 2012, a catastrophic impact and there's been a refugee crisis, etc. So there's been that side of it. There's also been many economic hardships in many of much of the developed world. So many people are economic migrants. But there's also been on top of that an interest by different employers in hiring people from um, the middle classes of developing countries and in many cases up to 16% of these uh, migrant workers in countries like Australia and the United Kingdom are paid at a rate lower than the minimum wage. So in, the, in Australia it's up to 16% paid under the minimum wage for, for uh, different industries, uh, constructions, uh, an example, fruit picking, uh, uh, restaurant and food industry, you know, there, there are examples where at least $3 uh, less than the, the hourly minimum wage rate that they're getting paid and things like forced overtime, etc. So there's, yeah, there's an incentive for employers and companies to, to have this kind of essentially what, you know, amounts to cost cutting in some ways and that has an impact on society. It can create a, a backlash by many groups as well. Uh, the unaffordability in the living in the West and seeing an erosion of standards and lack of work-life balance. Things are getting more expensive in Australia. There's a uh, there's a housing crisis in many Western countries. There's a cost of living crisis, and um, obviously policymakers are, are responsible for a lot of this. There needs to be sustainable sustainable economies. Obviously, austerity was also a policy that was since 2015. So in the United Kingdom, it was since 2015, but across many countries, which sent the many seem to forget it was often under the radar. We have many more seemingly populist leaders who some of their actions are exposed more, some some of these things are more under the radar. But austerity was it was a big thing that came in almost 10 years ago. Uh, many of these preconditions alongside identity politics have provoked reactions from groups adjoining the identitarian concept, which has led to things like many anti-immigrant attitudes. So identity politics on the left and right goes hand in hand eventually and erodes basic, you know, examples of, of social conditions for, for anyone. Um, within social media, as a consequence of this, echo chambers occur on the left and right, both perceiving social justice from different lenses and not adequately addressing primary issues. As mentioned too, in many cases, it's not even tempting to address any social issues at all. It's just the mongering and emotive reactionary approaches. In terms of yeah, many social media outcomes, the outcome is ineffective engagement with democratic processes, which usually takes the form of academic institutions, professionals, research institu institutes and experts guiding policy uh, with policymakers. 
Instead, there is an excuse for political bodies to listen to social media hysteria and as a reason to not act for, uh, for social sustainability. At the same time, the compounded impact of social media can infiltrate institutions, including fringes within academia, as well as politics and other institutions, including the media. So it acts as a means to stagnate progress when things are polarised. Um, there's always going to be that battle and only certain um, economic interests are really going to profit from that and society won't, obviously. The different ideological and epistemological focuses are impacted, so it can really downgrade certain epistemological focuses, really, from what they should be and diverges us from uh, classical liberal approaches to human rights and democracy from which they were founded, and divergences from, from this can occur if, if this is left unmitigated. Echo chambers can amplify flawed epistemological approaches as well as misinformation primarily, undermining things culturally which can feed into institutions. So there can just be this largely infiltration of, of undemocratic processes existent on a cultural level and then this can feed into institutions which should be immune to this. So just in terms of a solution, a proper safeguards within institutions to ensure that proper epistemological and science-based approaches, so that if we're talking about human rights or social well-being, you know, we're talking about mental well-being, mental health, psychological, you know, evidence-based approaches there, in line with the high standards of civil liberties, democracy and human rights uh, is essential. So there needs to be these safeguards within institutions to mitigate the threat of this issue on institutional integrity um, in the West. Yeah, thank you all for coming.